you in this visionary conference and in this great place of learning and inquiry. I must say that I've always been rather partial to Warwick. And let me conf confess upfront that it's not just because it is such a university of world acclaim. I'll tell you the story. Sometime in 1975, our then young and dashing military head of state, General Yakubu Gawan, was overthrown in a military coup while he was away from home at a conference in Kampala, Uganda. In those days in Africa, if you were ousted in a coup, you were either killed or detained. General Gawan was fortunate. He escaped here to the UK. He was offered a place here in Warwick. While he was here, another coup attempt was made which led to the unfortunate death of the then head of state. General Gowan, he was, as many believed then, falsely accused of being involved in the plot, and some of his adversaries called for his extradition. As the folklore goes, the British authorities and Warwick stood solidly behind him, and he remained here safe. As a young, brash, hot-headed Nigerian, I decided that if I were ever to lead a revolution and it failed, I would head for Warwick. <laughs> this, this place of freedom and refuge. And I'd remain here until the dust settled. Of course, there's another good reason why I am partial to Warwick. My son, Fee, is here, and he's um, also uh, one of the organizers of this uh, summit. But um, that's not exactly the reason why I am uh, happy that he's here. When he's here, uh, life is cheaper for me. <laughs> My car, for one thing, is safe. So I really am pleased that it's here. And um, I'm also, of course, excited to be here with you all. And I thank you again very much for this honor. The theme of the summit, I'm told, is Ubuntu, relighting the fire of Africa. Ubuntu, as we've heard already, is an Nguni term with variants in other dialects. And as the Zulus would say, Umuntu, Ugumuntu, Ngabuntu, which means that a person is a person through others. I am what I am because of who we all are. It's a belief in the universal bond of humanity. We validate our own humanity through our responsibility to other human beings, regardless of race, color, gender, or belief. Indeed, Africa is because of the rest of the world. Africa is because of the rest of the world. My thesis this morning is then essentially Africa's historic responsibility to the rest of the world. And I've titled my thoughts uh, The Africa Century. So the, my, my topic will be The Africa Century. Two weeks ago, I was uh, privileged to give a talk at the Harvard Business School. It was titled Africa Rising. And as I reflected further on the subject, it became clearer to me that aside from the encouraging narrative of some of the giant strides that Africa has made in the last 15 years, there is a fairly more profound insight. And that insight is that it is this century that is the African century. And before I elaborate, let me say that neither that expression, that is the African century, nor the general notion that it implies is original. Indeed, many African leaders before me, such as Thabo Mbeki and Unko Sezana Zuma, have used the same words to describe the great advances that Africa is making, especially in contrast to the last century. The variant that I add to it is this that this is the African century because in this century, Africa will, for good or ill, play the defining role in global development. Let me repeat that. That in this century, Africa will, 
for good or for ill, play the defining role in global development. And it implies that Africa will shape and will matter in all of the trends that will shape the future of the world in this century. I say for good or for ill, because either scenario is possible. Given the checkered history of Africa's development, it's not always the case that the glaringly obvious path to progress and development is taken. If Africa fails, the global impact will be catastrophic. If it succeeds, the global impact will be unimaginable. But there are at least four important respects in which Africa will hold the balance of world development. First is in world population, demography. Second is in environment and climate change. Third is production, especially agriculture, manufacturing and technology. Fourth is social exclusion and its implications for global security. I'll examine first what I'll describe as the doomsday scenarios in these four different areas or four different indicators before looking at our present efforts and projections for the future. Let's take population. By 2035, Africa will have 1.2 billion people. Nigeria, its most populous country, will become the fourth most populous nation in the world. Over 50% of that number will be young persons under the age of 25. Today, 60% of the unemployed in Africa are young people. And if we do not change the trajectory of our socioeconomic development, we would have millions of jobless young people in the prime of their lives. And we will see that that number will be largely illiterate and poorly trained. The workforce will be ill-equipped to man any industrial revolution or take advantage on scale of technology. The anger, disillusionment, and hopelessness of these young people will drive social unrest, compel more desperate migration northwards, and present a fertile recruiting ground for extremist groups and ideologies. If social conditions remain tenuous, even the well-educated will be tempted into migration and contribute further to the brain drain. Now, how about the environment and climate change? So it's generally agreed that although Africa has contributed least to global warming, it is and will suffer most of its consequences. Indeed, we are already seeing extreme weather events, such as flash floods, desertification, drought, and unseasonal occurrences in several parts of Africa. Lake Chad, Africa's fourth largest lake, surrounded by Nigeria, Niger, Chad, and Cameroon, in 1960 covered 25,000 square kilometers. It has now shrunk to less than 1,350 square kilometers. So the water it provided for integration, for, for, for irrigation, for fishing, for livestock, for millions, is now practically non-existent. Lake Tanganyika in East Africa, and that's one of the oldest lakes in the world, located in the western branch of the Great African Rift Valley, flowing through countries like Tanzania, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Burundi, and Zambia, was recently declared the threatened lake of 2017. Why? Lake Tanganyika is adversely affected also by human activity, in the form of climate change, deforestation, overfishing, and hydrocarbon exploitation. Again, clearly, if we maintain the same trajectory and we don't implement an aggressive plan for the environment, Africa might be the place where the perfect storm will occur. And what's the perfect storm? It is that apocalyptic event predicted by John Beddington, the former scientific advisor to the UK government. And he says that it will occur when competing needs for food, water, and energy race ahead of our response to that, especially our response despite the needs that we have to compensate for in climate change. To quote him, he said, and I quote, it is predicted that by 2030, 
the world will need to produce around 50% more food and energy, together with 30% more fresh water, whilst mitigating and adapting to climate change. This threatens to create a perfect storm of global events. There's not going to be a complete collapse, thank God, but things will start getting really worrying if we don't tackle these problems, end of quote. As for production, that is agriculture, manufacturing and technology, Africa's share of global GDP is only 3%. And unless production is ramped up across agriculture, across manufacturing and technology, the outlook for the continent and the rest of the world will be troubling indeed. Take agriculture. Agricultural production and productivity is well below full potential. Although the continent has 65% of globally available arable land, up to 50% of it is uncult uncultivated. Assuming we continue at the pace we're going now, Africa will be unable to feed its own population and will lack the resources to import. And as the food needs of the world rises with population, and of course the population growth, as, as, as I said earlier, is growing exponentially, a significant proportion of the world's arable land, which as we've seen is in Africa, will only be suboptimally sub productive. The outcome will be an unsustainable dependence on food, on food aid and continued insecurity, food insecurity. In manufacturing, Africa is at the risk of what is described as premature deindustrialization. In other words, the service sector is growing rapidly in African countries while it is yet to experience industrialization in the first place. This situation has serious implications for job creation, competitiveness, and participation in the global value chains. It is further complicated by digitalization and the fourth industrial revolution, which, and we know that that is going to create uh, the loss of several traditional jobs. And we'll talk about that a little as we go further. The fourth area that bears close watching is inequality and social exclusion. The UNDP has reported that every single African country is less equal today than they were in 2010 on account of lack of jobs and opportunity and lingering extreme poverty. Illiteracy is a factor. In sub-Saharan Africa, one in three adults is illiterate and over 50% of women are illiterate. Youth literacy in sub-Saharan Africa is the lowest of any other region. Now, literacy, as defined by UNESCO, is merely someone who can read and write a short, simple statement about their life. Now, that's a very low threshold. And, of course, does not begin to address the issues about functional literacy in the 21st century. Besides, high levels of malnutrition in children also mean stunting in growth and poor development of the brain. The ability of both individual and society to develop and compete is impeded by the low mental capacity of its growing population. So this, what I've described, is the doomsday scenario. Africa's population growing exponentially, food production not being able to match population growth, nutritional inadequacy, a rise in transhumans conflicts due to shrinking vegetation and water, lack of jobs and opportunity for a massively poorly educated youth population, leading to vulnerability to extremism and aggressive illegal migration. But perhaps most troubling, immediately, is that Africa runs the risk of becoming a convenient breeding ground for extremist groups from where they can launch out to the rest of the world. A horrifying situation indeed. If in the next three decades Africa drops the ball, on any of the four indicators I've mentioned, there will be a tragedy for the entire world. Neither Africa nor the rest of the world can afford to have these scenarios playing out. As we say in Nigeria, God forbid. <laughs> but let us, flip, let us flip this doomsday scenarios and see what it is that is being done on the four indicators and what needs to be done to ensure that the 21st century will be the Africa century in its most positive sense. With regard to the environment, Africa presents huge on the green economy as a source of growth. 
The green economy is one that promotes environmental sustainability and equitable economic growth at the same time. This can happen, for instance, through investments in renewable energy, energy sufficient processes, and clean technology. Solar installation can, for instance, be used to tackle Africa's huge energy deficit while creating jobs. Up to two thirds of Africans do not have access to electricity. And it's quite feasible to expect that the continent will take a huge chunk of the estimated 20, 24 million jobs that will arise from operations and maintenance and manufacturing of solar systems. And as part of the efforts to diversify power sources in order to improve access, we started a program of providing solar power in several thousand homes in rural villages back home. We started in a village called Wuna. Wuna is a village just outside Abuja. Abuja is the capital of Nigeria. 